This video is an alternate method for making the outer shell and perimeter of the egg chair. In the first part, we made this surface as a boundary, knowing what the chair looked like from the side view, and also knowing what it looked like at each cross section. Then we made a boundary, extended it, and then trimmed it back using the side view sketch. In this video, the surface is actually going to be a fill surface, and we need to know what the chair looks like from the side view, the front view, and the top view. So I'll now roll back the feature tree and we'll take a look at all of our layout sketches. The right layout sketch is identical to the one that I showed you in the first part. There are no changes there. I'll just briefly turn that on and I think I'll hide this curvature comb which is a little distracting. I just want to re-emphasize one thing is that in this area the curve should be relatively flat. It should not be flat in this area and then suddenly aggressively curve in in this area. If you do that you're likely to get a lump in this part of the chair. So we'll close that and what we're going to end up doing is making some projected sketches and you always want to make a projected sketch from the most advantageous view. So for the seat back we want to have a view of the side view and of the front view. For the seat pan we want to have a view of the side view and the top view. So our first layout sketch beyond the side view is going to be our seat back sketch seen from the front. And you'll notice I don't even have the rest of the perimeter shown in front. This area down here would be the seat pan. We don't really care what it looks like in this view because we're going to be using the top view to create that. So before in part one we controlled everything with the cross-sectional sketches and put dimensions on those. In this version, part two, or method two, we need to have some critical dimensions shown in the actual front view here. So you might remember that the wing-to-wing -wing dimension was 33.5 inches. So that's going to this point here. This is a vertical control handle. This is the highest point of the wings. This is a horizontal control handle. And this is even with this point here. So this point and this point are the same altitude. This point and this point are the same altitude. And this 14 inches, I just uh, put a dimension in that made this look good. And down here, I brought the sketch all the way down to this point here, and I estimated approximately how wide the chair is in this area. I didn't even bother trying to figure out what the notch area really looks like. Finishing that sketch, we'll now look at the top. Turn that on. And again, we're not bothering with how the seat back looks from this view. We're just bothering with the seat pan. You recall that it was 31 inches wide at the bolsters, and it's about 26 inches wide right where this portion of the seat occurs. You might end up needing to adjust these a tiny bit. And this point aligns with this point, this point, aligns with this point, and in this sketch this point aligns with this point. I want to introduce some extra planes and like in part one I really only needed it turns out to have this plane here but my locating sketch also includes some extra planes in case I need to use them. So I'm going to use a plane right at the top here through this point, 
plane through the high point of the bolster and a plane through the angled part of the notch. I've got an extra plane here that I'm probably not going to use in the shoulder area. And now what I'm going to do is make a bunch of projected sketches. And I'm going to make the projected sketches from their most advantageous direction and then piece them all together into one contiguous seam and put that into a 3D sketch. So I'll start with the lower area. And then, like before, I'm going to put the feature tree into the flat view so that all the features are in their original order. And what I've done is I've copied this sketch from the top view and from the side view I'm only copying this portion of the side view sketch down to where the bolster goes to its lowest point and I also copied this angled line here and made, a, and made it a construction line and use that to trim this curve right to that point. Then I took those two sketches and turned them into a projected sketch, which you can see here in blue. I then did the same thing for the back region here just borrowed this part of the side view sketch and use this line and this line to trim it to this point and this point. In this case, I projected that using this portion of the front view sketch and trimmed it right to this point, which is the same height that I trimmed this portion to. Projecting those together, I get this little piece of our outer perimeter. Probably wondering why I'm doing this in so many pieces. And then I'll just summarize here. The last piece is up here. And I utilized just this little piece from the top front view and this little piece from the top side view again trimming them to the appropriate points giving us a 3D curve so you can sort of see let me turn off the sketches themselves you can sort of see what that perimeter is going to look like there's two gaps in here one here and one here and these are kind of in these gray zones that are difficult to figure out whether you should project them from the front or from the top so, but these areas, it's pretty clear what direction you want to project them from. So my idea is to copy these three pieces into a 3D sketch and then add splines to bridge across these little gaps. So we'll go and look at that sketch now. This portion here is copied from the projected sketch. This is copied and this copied. And then this piece is a new spline, just a two-point spline I drew in, making, making them tangent at both ends. And I did the same over here. And that just seemed to give a more pleasing curve here that looked good in all angles. And when I drew those, I used the side view sketch as an underlay to kind of guide how much I wanted to stretch these handles. So I just manually stretched it until they were more or less lying on top of the layout sketch, but this was all done visually. And I did that from not only the side view, but from the front view as well. Now this is a spline or a curve that's been pieced together out of a lot of pieces. So what I did was made another 3D sketch, copied the previous 3D sketch into it, and then converted all of those pieces into a fit spline so that this is just one nice contiguous curve. Now that I have that curve, 
let's make this visible and make my other curves hidden. And I'll hide this one and hide this and finally hide this. We can see the chair taking shape. We've got the back and we've got this contiguous outer perimeter. And we're going to take the same information that we used in part one to build up our cross sections. So just like before, drawing the same type of a cross section, putting in length data on the spline, but this time I don't need to put the width data on it because I already have that built into my 3D sketch. So in this case I'm going to pierce my new spline to this 3D perimeter sketch. I'm going to do that for all three cross sections. We see the bolster sketch is pierced right to the top here, so this is at the maximum height, which corresponds to this point in the side view. Again, put a length dimension on the spline. So these cross sections are basically the same as what you saw in part one. And finally, the notch area. In the notch area on part one, this was 26 inches wide, but now we're going to be piercing to this part that we drew in by hand. And so this ended up not being quite 26 inches wide in this area, but it's close enough. We can ignore this stretched um, sketch that I had used before that's not used for this tutorial. And But what I am going to do is make a copy of the lower red line. Just a simple copy from here to here. I don't stretch it at all. But what I am going to do is extrude it in the negative x direction. And that's going to be an edge that I'm going to attach my fill surface to. So let's go ahead and hide some of this stuff. Seem to have some leftover sketches that should not even be in this file. What we can see now is I have three cross-sectional sketches. I have an edge and I have a perimeter. And so we're perfectly set up now for a fill surface. And the fill surface just uses two edges to create the the outer perimeter of the fill. One edge is the 3D sketch that we copied and converted to a fit spline. The other is the edge of our temporary extruded surface. This edge is going to be set to tangent. And then in our constraint curves box, that's where we're going to add our three cross sections. It takes a few seconds for it to build this surface up. So now we have our completed shell. And I think this comes out slightly smoother than the method one. And you have some very good control over the outer edge here. You can see again there's a little bit of shadowing through here. And you can also see but this flares out a little bit when you look at it from this direction. So what you might end up having to do is adding another cross-sectional sketch here on a brand new plane. And use that technique I talked about where you first make a sketch on that plane, make an intersection of it to see what the shape is, delete the relation, move it up in the feature tree before the fill surface is made, 
and use that as an underlay to figure out what the true shape should be for that part of the fill surface. So let's look at this from the front view and hide our temporary surface. I hid the wrong surface. And we can see that we have a nice view of the perimeter coming up and forward. The top view, we can see the entire perimeter. That's pretty much what we want. And going back to the front view again, if I just rotate this, we see a very subtle bulge here, but not very bad. I think that's really good looking. And I've looked at the real chair, and you can actually perceive just a little bit of that on the real chair. And if we look at this, it doesn't look like it's tucking in quite so much in the notch area. So the only thing that would have to be fixed is what's going on here. I'll mention one last thing. Is if you look at the real chair, the front edge comes down at an angle kind of a flat angle and then very more quickly curves in this area and then flattens out again. So it almost looks like two lines joined by a radius. So if you want to have that effect on this one, you might have to have an additional front view sketch and you have to create a separate projected sketch just for this very front area. That's going to be a lot more work and might cause you some additional problems. So if the front of your chair is rounded like this, which is not quite realistic, and that happened on the first method as well, that's perfectly acceptable. So that's it for our two methods, and whichever one ends up working for you, that's the one you want to use. The rest of this is the same as method one, as I showed you for making the seat area and offsetting it and so on. Good luck.